Unfortunately, the, uh, the sound from yesterday is all wonky. I've got a bad battery somewhere in my... I've got a bunch of rechargeable AAAs I use for these mics. And like, there's one that's just too old. I need to throw it out. And I gotta figure out which one it is. <laughs> so, what's that? Use a, well, yeah, I have a battery checker thing at home, but it shows up good because it's like, it does have, I mean, it can show up the whole, show the whole voltage. It's just like when you actually draw current from it, like drops down or, I don't know. But, um, in any event, I'll begin with a word of prayer. So. Dear Father, we uh, thank you for this day again. I thank you for these students. Just pray that you just bless this class. Help us to just glorify you and what we do this day, Lord. In your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Um, huh. Well, got a pocket full of batteries. That must be related. Um, yeah, so sorry I haven't posted the solution yet. I do mean to. Of course, not to the last page because I want you guys to figure that out. That's, I'll collect it Tuesday. Hopefully everybody can get that. Um, of course, you should probably start working on Mission 3, which I meant to turn to you guys yesterday, but um, sorry, I not, felt like I had two pages. <laughs> um, now, of course, this, the, all of the missions, right, they're in Canvas already, so if you, you know, you're like, I want to just finish this course, well, you can take the weekend and work ahead if you want. I mean, <laughs> I'm just joking, you probably should not try to do that. I mean, if you could, it would be impressive. But here's mission three. My point is mission three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, they are all, um, wait a minute, you already have this. Um, they're all um, posted in Canvas already. Um, so let me just take a gander here. Um, it's like problem 32, that's on the topology stuff, so you just want to try to draw a picture of that set and try to answer the questions there. Remember what an interior point was we said yesterday? Um, boundary point, we talked about that yesterday. Um, problem 33, you're supposed to um, find the domain of the function and determine where it's continuous, so you guys tell me. Um, hey, there's a typo here. Man, so in this problem, just cross out at the start of problem 33. See that at the start of problem 33, there is a, uh, I have got like let f of x, y equals x squared minus y squared. And then I've got another let, <laughs> there's two f's. I really just mean for there to be one f here. That's like a, a leftover, I mean, just cross out the square root formula, yeah? At the start of problem 33. Okay. Like just cross out the square root formula. Maybe that works. Who knows? Um, <coughs> it's probably out of focus. But now, if you look at the formula, f of x comma y sine of x squared y plus y squared over x squared plus y squared for x y not equal to zero and f of zero zero equal to a. So the reason I have to define f of zero zero separately in that problem is because when you plug in 0 and 0 into the given formula, it doesn't make sense, right? So we're defining the value at the origin to be separately be A, whatever A should be. And then the problem is to choose an A which makes that function continuous. What did it mean for a function to be continuous? Meant, the that meant the limit exists and the limit is equal to the value of the function at the point, right? <coughs> so. I would point out, you're supposed to show that it's continuous on R2. At every point except for the origin, you can use, just use the simple um, rule of thumb that if the formula makes sense, you plug the limit point in, right? So if I plug in like a comma b not being zero into that function, I just get f uh, sine of a squared plus b squared divided by a squared plus b squared. That's the limit, and it's also equal to the value of the function. So it is clear, although you should write this down in your solution, that <coughs> the function is continuous at non-zero points. So all that remains, the interesting part, is to figure out what the limit should be at zero. And I leave that to you, that's the homework problem, right? Writing down what I just said is also part of the homework problem. You should give a complete solution, all right? Um, anyway, so I just wanted to say a word or two about those. Now I have, so, um, and, and the same problem 34, 
the same animal, right? You're um, supposed to determine the value. Um, this, one's, this one's a little bit different, but I, I made the limit point variable and said to figure out the value of the limit <coughs> for variable points. So you got to think about all different possible choices of A, B and what happens at those different choices. Surely there must be some choice where it makes it, you know, complicated. Okay. Um, and then past that point, we are into uh, differentiation, which is where I want to be today. So, <coughs> here's my somewhat suspect attendance sheet. Let's come back again. I will eventually clean my office and find the more new attendance sheet, and then we'll start marking on there. But as long as I have it marked somewhere, we're good. Any questions? We pretty much always have time for questions in here, with rare exceptions. So if you have questions, just speak up, right? So let's get into some examples. Um, let me just make a remark before I do that, though. Independent variables, independent variables x and y have partial x, partial y equals to zero, and partial y, partial x equals to zero. All right? Independent variables x, y, z have partial x, partial y equals to partial y, partial x equals to partial z partial x equals to partial z, partial y equals to partial x, partial z equals to partial x. Wait, I got everything. x with y, x with z, y with x, oh, y with z. All right. So I've got x with y, x with z, y with x, y with z, z with x, z with y. These are all zero. So. Context matters. See, here's the, here's the thing. Up here, you might have w, you might have z, you might have z is equal to some function of x, y, right? Then partial z, partial x, not equal to zero, possibly, all right? And up in there. So the meaning of z as it relates to x and y depends on the problem. There's context we have to keep in mind. Okay? Um, <clears throat> I mean, already, in Calculus 1, what did you do? You, you don't, remember Calculus 1, we did things like um, we had x squared plus y squared equals to 1. We took that, we differentiated with respect to y, right? I mean, with respect to x. We did implicit differentiation in Calculus 1. So what, what, was, what was the backdrop of implicit differentiation? What do we assume? We assume y is a function of x, right? When you're doing that, x and y are not independent. In fact, they're inextricably linked by some sort of defining equation. So context matters. We can't just always know one of these or the other of these is zero. OK, so with that backdrop, let me just do some examples. So what if we're up against partial partial x of x to the y? What if we've got partial partial x of y to the x? So what's the derivative for the first one? The answer is y x to the y minus 1. Why is that? This is like d dx of x to the n, right? n x to the n minus 1. That's the underlying rule of calculus 1 we're using here. Remember, n is what? n is a constant in that rule, just like y is a constant with the partial derivative with respect to x. How about the next one? Well, this one is more like what? This is more like d dx of a to the power x, right? Which, remember, is natural log of a 
times a to the x. Remember that? So here I have natural log of y times y to the power x. Now I need some terms and conditions. What, what do I have to presuppose here? What condition do I need for this one? <laughs> yeah, I need y is not equal to zero. Can anybody add to that? Greedier. More than just y not equal to zero. We need y positive. Otherwise we can't take the log. All right. Let's go on here. Um, <clears throat> example two. Let's suppose we have f of, we'll do x, y, z equals to the sine of x squared plus y squared and then plus the hyperbolic cosine of x, y, z. So let's calculate some partial derivatives. I'm going to use the other notation, so partial f, partial x, right? Another notation for that is just f sub x, all right? Um, and another notation for that, you're like, yay, another notation, hooray, um, is partial sub x of f. Like, I sometimes really like that last notation because it's, <coughs> it's kind of got the best of both worlds. So um, I was talking to Violet in office hours yesterday, and she asked me about the partial. Um, first of all, she wanted to know if the, partial, if the partial circles back on itself or not. And I think the answer is yes, at least in my notation. See, sometimes my partial comes back and sometimes my partial doesn't, right? Here it's open, here it's not open. I think in the usual like proper typesetting, it's not quite open. It kind of almost gets there, but doesn't get there. It's not a Greek letter. It's like a Latin. Um, it's like a, it's like a, um, I think it's like a script D in lowercase Roman or something. But anyway, for us it is partial, all right? So it's not D. We should not write D in the place of partial. And those symbols need to be distinct in your writing because we will give a different meaning to D versus delta, versus partial in here. Partial means that you're differentiating something where there is more than one independent variable and you're just varying one of those variables while holding the other one fixed. That's the difference. A total derivative means that you're differentiating something which is depending on just one variable and you're differentiating with respect to that one independent variable. That's the difference in the notation. That's what the notation indicates. All right, anyway, how's this go? So I'll break it down. We can do partial x of the sine, right? plus partial x of the, co of the cosh. And guess what? Partial derivatives have all the usual laws of differential calculus. So we've got like chain rule, right? So chain rule, and I'll write it out. I get cosine of x squared plus y squared, right? Times the partial derivative with respect to x of x squared plus y squared. That's chain rule. Derivative of cosh is cinch. So I get plus cinch of the inside function, which is time is x, y, z which I've written as x, y, x because I'm an idiot, x, y, z, and that's partial x of the inside function, which is x, y, z. All right, what next? Let's actually calculate the derivatives of the inside functions. I'm going to write them here. This is 2x. This is what happens when you partial differentiate x, y, z with respect to x. Well, Yep, just yz. So the answer here is, I like to write the thing first. So 2x cosine of x squared plus y squared plus um, yz, hyperbolic sine of xyz. So there you go. Now, if you'd like me to drill down further into why the partial derivative with respect to x of x, y, z was that, it's basically just this. Like, the reasoning for that is this. Partial x of x, y, z, right, is equal to partial x of x times y, z, y.
the chain rule. Well, how about this? This is a constant. That's a constant with respect to the x partial derivative. So I can pull it out. What am I assuming here? I'm assuming we're working with x, y, z independent variables, right? That assumption is implicit at the start when I write this. This is my way of communicating to you x, y, and z are independent variables. <coughs> okay? And then, of course, this is one. We, I kind of showed you the proof of that last time. At least I projected it. That counts, right? If I show something on the projector screen for like three seconds, that means that it's improved, right? Seems reasonable. Honestly, do you guys really want me to prove every last lemma in here? No, you don't. So let me fight my more baser urges to prove everything. I don't know, is that a base urge? I don't know. I'm only starting to understand fully what it means to be based. I'm working on it, though. Um, <clears throat> so what's next? How about the z derivative? What would that look like? I'll just write it down. So, okay, fine, I'll, I'll give you one step. Partial z of cosine of sine of x squared plus y squared, right? Plus partial z of cosh of x, y, z. This, we don't need to belabor, this is zero. Because there is no z dependence on that term, so just blip, gone. And this here works out to, when we differentiate the inside with respect to z, we get x, y, and we get cinch of x, y, z. Yay. Let's calculate f, y. f, y is going to be 2y cosine of x squared plus y squared um, plus y, z. My bad. Not y, z, right? What is, what is here? x, z hyperbolic cinch of x, y, z. Now, now we can put these all together, right? What's the gradient of the function? Nabla. Upside down triangle f. Some books would call this grad f. What a, that, that notation is too easy for the students. Like, I can't use that notation. It's almost in the name. It's the gradient, right? That would make it too easy. So I'm going to call it nabla f instead. No, I'm calling it nabla f because that is the notation which is dominantly used in science and engineering, and it's a good notation. It has other notational um, advantages, because you can essentially think of nabla as like a vector of operators. You can think of nabla as being this, x hat partial x plus y hat partial y plus z hat partial z. And if you do that, <coughs> When you hit that vector of operators on the function, what happens? You get x hat partial xf plus y hat partial yf plus z hat partial zf. Of course, in, uh, in the other notation, this is just what? fx, fy, fz. <laughs> <clears throat> and so we've already calculated all three of these, right? So we have the gradient vector field. What is it? I mean, I can write it out if I remember. You got yourself a 2x cosine of x squared plus y squared um, plus yz cinch of x, y, z, and then um, what we got? Um, 2y cosine of x squared plus y squared plus x, z, cinch of x, y, z, comma, um, y, x, 
cinch of x, y, z. This is why these boards should be put together, you know? Who leaves this little blue strip? It's so, um, just, who did this? Like, this is, this was not done by a math teacher. Oh, those are axes. <laughs> if I drew axes like that, it would be like this. Like, no, no. It's just dumb. All right, let me continue with some dumb things. Uh, excuse me, these are not dumb. These are beautiful things. Are you guys, are everyone following me with the partial differentiation? Yes? <clears throat> All right, so of course we can calculate deeper things, more annoying things, right? Like what is f, um, let me write it this way, partial squared f, um, partial x, partial y, what would that be? So that would be partial partial x of partial f partial y. What is, what I do? Yeah, that's a 2y. What were you thinking? A z? Well, at first, but then I looked at your other z and I had a Yeah, I always put the line through the z. That helps fix this a little bit. But and I looked back at the x. And it but then you're like, somewhere else, somewhere else in my calculation, you'll notice that I wrote 2 this way. And then you'll be like, wait a minute. What is that? Is that a... No. See, so admittedly, I will tell you, this 2 is equal to this 2. But just so you know, this z is equal to this z in my writing. I never distinguish between those z's. I just, my mind goes between those two notations. I would just warn you. Could you like morph that two into a partial? <clears throat> I could not. So, <laughs> ah. so we're going to calculate partial x of what? Partial y, fy, right, which was up here. So I've got, I'm up against 2y cosine of x squared plus y squared plus xz cinch of xyz. Now, now what would I have to do? Well, the, the, basically you can think about this 2y is coming out, right? The 2y pulls out of the x derivative, so I get 2y times what? The derivative of cosine of x squared plus y squared is minus 2x sine of x squared plus y squared by the chain rule. I get the 2x pull out. The derivative of sine, cosine is minus sine. Then what? That's the first term. And then I get what over here? Let me write it out. I've got partial x, partial x of z cinch of x, y, z plus um, x times partial partial x of z cinch of x, y, z. What did I just do there? This is important. We got to recognize this is a what? This is a product of functions of x. So I have to do the product rule. There's a subset of you who are desirous to have forgotten the product rule and or to modify it to your own purposes now. You're doing the thing that must not be done, namely that the derivative of a product is the product of the derivatives. This is not so. Let it not be so in your work. I have enough points. I don't want yours. You know? So like, do the product rule correctly, please. For x, y, sine. This is easy to fix. Just got to watch out for products and Deal with them accordingly. So z cinch of x, y, z plus, well, when I differentiate this guy, what happens? I'm going to pull out a y, z, right? So I'll get a x, y, z squared cosh of x, y, z. 
so this right here pulls out pulls out a uh, a YZ from chain rule. And that YZ from the chain rule multiplies the XZ that's already here to give me XYZ squared. And of course the derivative of cinch is cosh. What'd I do? No? Something? Hmm. There's some kind of mischief with Shane. I, I haven't understood it fully yet. It was definitely a mischievous intent, which I like, but I must understand. Let's see here. So I can bend it and use it to my own purposes, of course. Let's see here. Um, <clears throat> I'm just kidding. It's not all about me. All right, so partial, partial squared x, partial squared f, partial f, partial. Let's do it the other way. That would be what? Partial partial y of partial f partial x, right? What was partial f partial x? Well, partial f we had over here, right? So that was 2x uh, cosine of x squared plus y squared um, plus yz cinch of xyz. All right. So when I differentiate this, I get the x pulls out and I just get a minus 2x, minus 4 rather. I get a minus 4xy sine of x squared plus y squared. I got to do the product rule on this one, which gives me plus z cinch of xyz. Um, and then I do the, the second part of the product rule, so plus um, yz times the cosh of xyz times the derivative of the inside, which is um, xz. And if you look at it, if you do the algebra on the last term I wrote down there, simplify it, what do you see? They should be equal, right? Do you guys see it? I know you're still writing. It's a lot to write. But this right here, if we do, so the, the last shall be first and the first shall be last here. So like this is f um, y x actually. And this one here is actually f x y because I did the, let me just be up, up here. So like f y x by definition is f sub y of x. So the way that works, of course, is partial x of f y, which is partial x partial y f, which of course is partial squared f partial x partial y. So just beware that the, the index notation, it flips the order of things technically. But why this is not, why doesn't this never get students into trouble? Is because there's a rule of differential, of partial differentiation, right? Which shows you that these two guys, guess what? They are equal. So this is known as Claro's rule. I can't spell it. I'll try again. I think it's Claro. That partial derivatives commute for nice enough functions. You do have to assume something about like continuity of the second partial derivatives to get this to go. There are counterexamples. There do exist functions who have partial derivatives which exist, and yet the second mixed partial do not agree. Those functions do exist, but they're hard to come by. So by and large, Certainly for like multivariate polynomials, for sines, for cosines, for exponentials, things like that. Things where you don't have some kind of um, annoying, basically the same problems that have annoying limits in your homework are the same kind of problems that have annoying mixed partial problems. Anyway, any questions? Yeah. Yes, like there has to be some kind of like discontinuity in the second partial derivatives. 
I think if the second partial derivatives are continuously differentiable, then that's when Clairaut's theorem works. But um, okay, so um, let me move on here. Um, so one one thing I should talk about briefly here, and I'd rather project this because it's more of a kind of cautionary tale than it is, um, you know, something we need to calculate. So, <clears throat> so I have many more examples of partial derivatives in the notes. I would encourage you to just read through those, make sure they make sense to you. All right, I got like I got like ten examples of just basic partial differentiation in the notes. So look over those, see if they make sense to you. Um, <clears throat> I guess I should do one while we're waiting for this thing to warm up. Example three. <clears throat> we can also play with other letters, right? Like example three. What if I'm calculating partial partial theta of the sine of theta plus beta? How would that work? Oh, no. So I do what? I do, I do, yeah, cosine of theta plus beta, right? And then partial partial theta of the inside, which is just one. Assuming what? Assuming that partial beta partial theta is what? Zero. That is to say that they're independent variables. Right? Now here's a fun thing. What is the sine of theta plus beta equal to? Well, it's equal to sine theta, cosine beta, plus cosine theta, sine beta, right? So if you take the partial derivative, partial derivative with respect to theta of this adding angles formula, what does it get for you? Looks like we get a cosine theta, cosine beta, right? Minus sine theta, sine beta. Aha! So if you know one of the adding angles formulas, you can differentiate and derive the other one. So if we memorize one and we can differentiate, we have the other. Now, I would have shown you this in calculus one just the same. Why? Because we differentiate functions with constants in the formula in calculus one, right? So is partial differentiation new? No, we've been teaching you partial differentiation since day one, like day 30 in calculus one. As soon as you have a problem in calculus one where you've got x and then you've got like constants a, b, c floating around, that is partial differentiation. It is, I mean it is. We just now have more to say about it. <clears throat> All right, so there's that. Oh, apparently the projector is not the problem. It's my computer. Go figure. Come on, wake up, computer. So I'm going to shift back to talking about directional derivatives again. All right. So I told you guys last time that the directional derivative was given by a particular formula, right? And the formula I have written at the top of the page here, do you see it? Let me make it bigger, yeah, a little bit smaller. <coughs> so, and I, I think I, I said for nice enough functions, didn't I? I did say for nice enough functions because the reason I said that is because it's not true for all functions. Like, so this formula, the directional derivative of f at the point x naught y naught in the direction a b, it's given by the gradient vector evaluated at the point dot product with the unit vector we're calculating the change of the direction, change of the function in that direction. There are calculus three books which use that as the definition of the directional derivative. This is poor mathematics really um, because there are functions which you can calculate the partial derivatives of, like this one. I have f of xy is x plus 1 for y equal to 0. 
it's y plus 1 for x equal to 0, and it's 0 elsewise, right? So um, the graph of it, if you were to look at like z equals to this function, it's kind of funky. Like it's, it's mostly 0, and then it's just a couple of like lines over the coordinate axes. You can, well, I can't picture it very well, but anyway, you can calculate the partial derivatives and the partial derivative with respect to x at the origin is 1. The partial derivative with, with respect to y at the origin is 1. But if you can calculate the directional derivative um, in the a, b direction at the origin, you have this, which works out to that, which is, um, um, yeah, that doesn't exist, right? Because the f basically what's going on is the function's discontinuous at the origin. It's 1 at the origin, and then it's 0 everywhere around it except for the, uh, the coordinate axes. So I think, this note, I think this, calculation, this calculation fails if a and b are either 1, 0, or 0, 1. So this is the, understand the context of this calculation is for a and b not equal to the x hat or y hat vector. Okay, that's the, the meaning of this calculation. Maybe I haven't written it, but I mean that. Um, however, see I say like this, blah, 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 which however, right? So this however it is missing some words. However, I should have right here, if a comma b is not equal to 1, 0, or 0, 1, then this happens. So this function, consider this, it has directional derivatives in the coordinate direction, which exist. Those are the partial derivatives. Yay, they exist. And yet every single other directional derivative fails to exist. So certainly you can't write a formula for them. The formula is pure nonsense. Here's another one. This is even easier. This one I can draw the graph easily. If I have a function which is 1 over the coordinate axis and then 0 down here, then the, again the x and y partial derivatives exist. They're 0. And yet the partial derivatives, the uh, directional derivatives in all other possible directions fail to exist. Right. By essentially the same calculation. So, for directional derivatives to be meaningful, and for the partial derivatives to be meaningful in their connection, we do need a function which is probably best to assume continuously differentiable. What's it mean to be continuously differentiable? A function from R2 to R is said to be continuously differentiable if and only if the partial derivatives, partial x, partial y, are continuous at the point. We say that f is in C1, x0, y0, if that's the case. If all the second order partial derivatives are continuous at x not y not, we can say it's in C2 of x not y not. If the continuous partial derivatives of arbitrary order exist at a point, we say that the function's smooth. So if I say a function is smooth in the multivariate sense, what I'm saying is you can partial differentiate forever and ever and ever, and all you get is continuous partial derivatives at the next order. Always, always, always. The nicest theorems hold for smooth functions. If you want to avoid annoying stuff that makes you say things that no engineer cares about. Just assume your functions are smooth and things go well. However, the devil's, well anyway, there's, even smooth is, is too much to assume. Sometimes we can't assume, well anyway, I'll shut up. Um, <clears throat> long story short here though, just pretty much we'll be working with smooth functions. And if we have in the, the, the second, the continuous differentiability of the second partials is what makes the partial derivatives commute like we were just talking about, okay, so. <clears throat> so, this is a proposition. Suppose f is continuously differentiable at x not y not, then the directional derivative in the x direction of the unit vector is given by this formula. Now, I will prove this later in the course, okay, but we're just not quite where we need to be to prove it. There's a a nice proof of it that comes up later, and I'll do that then, okay? But for now, we're just going to assume it's true, because it is, and we're going to learn how to calculate with it, all right? If that's okay with you guys. If it's not, I'm still going to do it, but so. Uh, that was just a rhetorical, if it's okay with you guys. All right, well, let me put this away now and work out some examples. All right, my 
Like we haven't done the quotient rule yet, have we? We should probably do something that does the quotient rule to us, shouldn't we? Let's try to make up something to do that here. <clears throat> Example four. Let's suppose we have f of x, y, z equals to um, x, y over y plus z. All right, let's calculate the directional derivative um, and let's, let's make it in the um, 1, 2, 3 direction um, of f at the point, oh, I don't know, um, let's say 4, 5, 6 there. That way, that way we can keep all the numbers separate. So you should have no trouble tracking, although it's going to make horrible numbers. Now, first of all, you should tell me, oh, this problem doesn't even make sense. Why does this not make sense? That is exactly, that is not a unit vector. So what do we need to do? To make this make sense, I should divide this by what? Square root of its length, which is 9 plus 4, 14, right? So if I divide that by square root of 14, yay, unit vector, good to go. Now, let's see here. I'm going to write up here, what's partial f partial x? It is y over y plus c. What's partial f partial y? It is, now that one's a little bit more complicated. I got to do my quotient rule, right? So quotient rule here gives me x minus um, xy times 1 divided by y plus z squared, I think. Now let me double check on that. Let me step away, think about it for a second. So the quotient rule says the derivative of the top, derivative of the top is what? It's, it's just x, right? Partial differ differentiate with respect to y of x, y is x. And then times, and then minus the top times the derivative of the bottom, right? So I'll write the pattern down if you guys forgot. F over g prime is f prime g minus f g prime divided by g squared, yeah? That's the quotient rule. And I think I did it. I write it f g prime. Oh, oh, you're saying I didn't do it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yay. So, yes, x times y plus z. Very good. Minus, what was it? Um, minus xy. Okay, thank you. Times 1, right? <laughs> but yeah. So, if I can erase my quotient rule. Sorry about that. It's in the way. This is going to give us... The xy's cancel, right? And we just get what? We just get xz divided by y plus z squared. I'm not sure I believe that. That feels wrong. Okay, it's fine. Never mind. I was thinking of something that's not relevant. All right, so then partial f partial z is what? That's easier, right? That's just minus xy divided by y plus z squared. I don't really need these parentheses here. I know what's wrong with me. So the, the, what I'm doing there, guys, is I'm, let me explain my logic to you. When I take partial partial z, of this, what I'm thinking is this is xy partial partial z of 1 over u. 
which is xy minus 1 over u squared partial u partial z, which is xy divided by, you know, xy plus z squared um, is a minus. And what's partial? Well, u here, I'm thinking of this as being my u. So partial u partial z is just 1. That, that's how I thought about that derivative. All right, so let me continue this down here. <coughs> Notice there was no plus involved, so this is, well, oh man, then, that means I'm writing equals equals, but, but Violet's not here, so I'm okay, right? Okay, so that was her complaint, I believe, um, which, I, I, which I welcome. So now we're supposed to do, we're supposed to do, I'm gonna write it out symbolically first, all right? So we, we, we're supposed to take fx and plug in the point four, five, six, right? And then we're supposed to take fy, plug in the point four, five, six. We're supposed to take fz and plug in the point four, five, six. You know what the big mistake people make here is? Not plugging in the point. very popular mistake. Much like the mistake people make with calculating this tangent line, I'm not plugging in the point of tangency, just giving me back velocity vector dot the thing. Anyway, yeah. How come <coughs> partial u has the denominator squared, partial y has the denominator squared, and partial x does it? Because there's no x dependence in the denominator. Okay. Mm-hmm. Because y over y plus z is a constant with respect to x. Yeah? Is it an option to plug in everything after you get that? Sure. It, yeah, I mean, that's true. You could, you could take the dot product um, at arbitrary x, y, z, and then evaluate at the point 4, 5, 6 if you wanted to. But it's easier to put the numbers in, I think. <coughs> I would definitely take this 1 over the square root of 14 and bring it out front. Goodness gracious, please do that. Right? You don't want that in there. Now if I plug in 4, 5, 6 into fx, what do I get? y over y plus z, which is 5, let's see here, 5 over 11. 5 over 5 plus 6 is 5 over 11. Now I've got xz, which is what? I'll write it out. 4 times 6 over 5 plus 6 squared, and then I've got minus 4 times 5 over 4, 5 plus 6. It looks like the denominator is always 5 plus 6, isn't it, at this point? 1, 2, 3. One more step here, 1 over the square root of 14. Um, let's see here. I might as well bring out an 11. I'm going to bring out an 11th, okay guys? Actually, I'm going to bring out a 1 over 121. You know why I'm going to do that? 11 squared is 121, right? And I've gotten 11 squared in both of the denominators, just not the first one, right? So, sneaky math trick, I could put this as 55. 24 minus 20, dot product 1, 2, 3. That will make my life easier. So I've got 1 over 121 square root of 14 times 55 plus 48 minus 60. So the rate of change is apparently 43 divided by 121 times the square root of 14. There you go. That's the rate of the change of the function xy over y plus z in the 1, 2, 3 direction at the point 4, 5, 6. So we have more of these to do. Like Monday, I'll talk more about like the max min idea I brushed, up, brushed across recently last class. I would encourage you to try to work the directional derivative problems like Look at the notes, see if you can understand it. You should be able to work some problems with the concept I talked about yesterday, but I haven't really worked out problems yet. Um, it's pretty simple, if you, if you just think about it. Anyway, I shut up.